At this point, we've become very familiar with the voltage divider uh, and the idea that placing a load, uh, a resistor across the outputs, because you want to do something with the outputs, uh, is going to change um, what comes from uh, your carefully constructed potentiometer or other voltage divider circuit. What I want to introduce today is a concept which goes well beyond just the voltage divider and can be generalized to any power supply. In fact, one that is, doesn't even have to be made out of, of resistors. Um, and to make that generalization clear, I've taken our now well understood potentiometer or voltage divider circuit and stuck it in a black box that has coming out of it only two terminals, a ground and an output. And uh, hopefully by the end of this video, you have gotten to the point where you can look at such black boxes, which exist in the laboratory all the time. And in fact, anytime you have, uh, say, a three and a half millimeter mono cable, uh, such as you're going to use in a modular analog synth, um, or really any other sort of device that's producing a voltage and be able to characterize it in terms of its behavior with respect to a given load. And that's the idea of equivalent circuits, and in particular, the Thevenin equivalent method, uh, which I'll be teaching today. The Thevenin equivalent has a very straightforward hypothesis, uh, which says that anything in that box, anything in that box with resistors, other components, can be replaced with simply two values. The first is the the Venin equivalent voltage, that's VTH. And the second is the Thevenin equivalent resistance. There's a very particular equivalent resistance we'll define in a moment called RTH. And at the output of this box, you have the two terminals ground and a wire that is floating at VTH, that potential voltage, uh, and has an internal resistance of RTH. And if you know the VTH and know the RTH, or at least can estimate the RTH for a power supply, you can guess what's going to happen when you hook up a load. And the load itself doesn't have to be a single resistor, but it could be a whole network of different configurations, or in fact, other different components, which can also be represented by a single load resistor. Now, how is the Thevenin equivalent circuit defined? It's defined such that the output voltage, VTH, drops in half when it's connected to a load that has the same resistance as RTH. So if I give you a power supply, which is a 9 volts DC with a Thevenin resistance of 100 ohms, I tell you this ahead of time, and you connect a 100 ohm resistor to that power supply, you expect the voltage to drop by a factor of two, that is from nine volts to four and a half volts, when you make that connection and bring that load uh, up to supply. So that's our definition. To determine um, the Thevenin equivalent circuit, we're going to do a analysis. Now I want to emphasize this is an analysis. This is not something which you generally should do experimentally in the way I have described. Uh, particularly if you do this with line voltage, it could be extremely hazardous. Um, you can do it with our voltage divider circuits generally, as it turns out, and actually you'll be, be doing that in the assignment. But again, these are thought experiments, ways to think about analyzing a problem and not measurements to actually necessarily make exactly the way I described. So the first step is to determine VTH. And VTH is going to be the open circuit voltage, that is the voltage across the circuit with nothing attached. That's by definition. Now, remember a perfect voltmeter draws no current. Uh, it has infinite resistance. Um, in fact, it's not infinite, but it's tens of millions of ohms. So essentially no current, and it basically doesn't load your circuit. So what you measure with a voltmeter across the open terminals is VTH. That's very simple, the open circuit voltage. Step two is, and this is the one you really don't want to perform 
in real life experimentally unless you're really pretty sure about some things about RTH. Uh, but let's think about what would happen if you now measure the short circuit current, I sub SC. Um, so short circuit, of course, is something which has zero resistance and your ammeter, again, is like a paddle wheel which is measuring the current flowing through the wire. And uh, it's going to sit there and spin, you could think of it as that, and, and measure a current through that short circuit uh, with zero resistance. So it's really just like you put a huge uh, hole in the dam and let all the water rush through as fast as it can, and you you measure that current. That's, of course, why you often don't want to do this experiment in reality. And so that gives you the short current circuit, uh, short current cir uh, short circuit current of I sub SC, measuring the current um, through a short. Um, and then the next step, step three, um, and pretty much the final step in terms of determining the Thevenin equivalent is to determine what this RTH is. And it turns out you get RTH just by dividing the open circuit voltage by the short circuit current, which results the last two measurements. So it's pretty simple. In principle, you measure the open circuit voltage with your voltmeter, then you measure the short circuit current, the current straight through the ammeter from the output to the terminal. You divide those two numbers. A volt over an ampere gives you an ohm, and that's RTH, the internal equivalent resistance. What is the output voltage for this configuration? So uh, when you add the load resistance. So if we look at this circuit diagram and we presume that everything inside the black box has been replaced by a VTH and an RTH, if we connect a load resistor, our load, across the terminals, this looks an awful lot like a voltage divider. In fact, it is a voltage divider where the top resistor is um, just a, an equivalent uh, uh, or imaginary, uh, where the input voltage would be VTH and uh, the top resistor is RTH. And so we already know the answer of how V out is going to change for any load resistor. It's going to change by the voltage divider equation. So the output voltage will be our load over our load plus RTH. Let's talk about some special cases uh, of load resistance. Uh, first of all, if there's no load on your equivalent circuit, the circuit's open, V out equals the Thevenin voltage. Second, if the load is a short, you short circuit it, your circuit, and if uh, VTH is zero, V out is zero. That makes sense. Now, here's some very important limiting cases specific to this event and equivalent, and what makes it so special. If our load equals RTH, so our load equals RTH, so the number inside the parentheses here in equation 13 becomes 1 over 2, or 1 half, then V out equals 1 half VTH. And that was our definition, of course, in the first place of this event and equivalent. Two more very important limiting cases, which we're going to talk about all the time and are sort of the things you always want to have in mind when you approach a, a new power supply or really any signal. And that is uh, the situation if our load is much greater than our TH, so maybe a factor of 10 or 100 more. This would be like the situation in the previous video where I had a 100 kilo ohm uh, resistor that was being uh, load placed on a voltage divider made of uh, 1 and 11 kilo ohm resistors. Um, and then we found we had a, a load which would much higher resistance than RTH. In that case, as we saw, um, our load is a big number, and a big number divided by a big number plus a small number is essentially 1. So this value in the parentheses is basically 1, and V out equals VTH. Our particular example it was 99% of VTH. So uh, a good load is one where our load is much bigger than RTH, and the output voltage hardly drops when you connect um, a load. If, however, our load is about equal to RTH, then we see that this quantity in the parentheses, uh, in fact, can have all sorts of values, uh, and V out can be significantly smaller than VTH 
or even just change quite a bit enough to be uh, a problem in our circuits, we call that a poor load. So a good load is a large resistor. And a poor load is a small resistor. Why is it a poor load? Because it draws a lot of current, loading the circuit, and dropping the voltage, dropping the signal from what you had hoped to put in. So think about an audio circuit where we want to do some processing on it. If we take our audio signal and we stick it into a plug-in, which is a good load, no problem. Um, the source continues to behave as expected. Uh, we're able to do manipulations on that signal and not concern that without concern uh, that in daisy chaining different plugins together, we are uh, changing our signal in other ways, in ways we don't mean uh, to do. However, if we have a poor load, when we take the output uh, of some uh, process, uh, some representing some audio signal, and we stick it into um, a poor load that is something with low resistance, a great example is a speaker, which has only eight ohms of resistance, so it's generally a poor load, and we do that with nothing else in between, our voltage is going to be dropped considerably and you know, typically say the speaker isn't going to be loud. A uh, signal that we thought had one particular amplitude will have much less or a pitch from a voltage control um, will do go down considerably. Um, I want to check uh, this result, 13, um, uh, by property 3, uh, which is that uh, loading with the source resistance always has the output voltage. So I'm going to show the algebra behind this. Uh, this is something you don't have to do yourself, but it is a nice check that it works. So here I have for my Thevenin equivalent circuit, we use a specific casing in the voltage divider. We have a top resistor R1, bottom resistor R2, a load uh, resistor R load, which we attach between zero volts and what's initially V out is going to drop, uh, of course, with the load resistor. And um, we can write RTH uh, using the reciprocal law. So we just shown. RTH is R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. This, that's the voltage at which, um, or the resistor value at which um, uh, this uh, voltage drops by half. Um, so first we'll insert the calculated R load. So there's our calculated value for the Thevenin voltage, only specific to the voltage divider circuit. Uh, we're going to take those bottom two resistors, uh, just as we did in the last video, and combine R load and R2 into one equivalent resistor. They're shown in green. And there is its value in equation 15. Uh, it's equivalent for this situation is of being 2 over R2 plus 1 over R1, and then the reciprocal of this entire quantity to get our equivalent this resistor in green. So this again accounts for that load that's been put on. Then we apply the voltage divider equation, but with our equivalent in the bottom. And again, we go through a bunch of algebra in equations 17 through 23 to simplify the load voltage for the special equation where we put the Thevenin equivalent in as the load. And at the end of the day, and uh, really the only way to get confident in this is to work through this steps yourself. You should arrive at equation 23, which is VL equals V out over 2. Um, again, which was our original definition. So I guess the point here is that the Thevenin equivalent works. Uh, you can take uh, the process of measuring the open circuit voltage, the short circuit current, or determining that um, you know, by some analysis, divide those two numbers, and that tells you the... Uh, how the power supply is going to behave uh, when you attach a load across it. And of course, a good supply doesn't change much. Um, so here's a quick summary. This, any circuit can be split into a source, that's the dark gray box, and a load, that's the light gray box. But connecting them changes the voltage. That is, the voltage is no longer the unloaded Thevenin voltage when they're connected, but it's going to drop. Um, and that is an unsolvable problem if we restrict ourselves to using resistors. Uh, and is often described as the loading problem. Um, and the solution to the loading problem is to find some sort of matchmaker. The matchmaker has to be some kind of device uh, which looks like a high resistance. 
when viewed from the source. So it looks like a high resistance somehow that you put in with a resistance approaching infinity that when you connect the source to the ground, almost no current flows. Yet somehow on the output, it looks like a very low resistance source when viewed from the load. It looks like it has a very small event and resistance itself is capable of driving any load, no matter how small, effectively without considerable voltage drop. Again, looking to the left towards the source, it looks like it has a very high resistance, so it draws no current. But on the other side, it has to look like it has very low internal resistance capable of driving any load effectively. Such matchmaker does exist, and its name is the op amp or operational amplifier. And listed here are the three golden rules of the op amp. Now these are idealized op amps and real world devices will not quite follow all these rules precisely, but these are the basic rules we use in designing and understanding how op amps work. The first golden rule is that the input lead draws no current. That is, I can take the input, which is on this side. So the op amp is this triangle. There's a plus and a minus side, uh, and there's an output, and the plus draws no current. So uh, it doesn't load um, the source at all. The output here has a Thevenin equivalent resistance of zero, so it can drive any current desired through the load resistor. And then finally, um, the most interesting in some way golden rule, uh, which is what the output does, which is that it attempts to always make the two input voltages the same. So again, imagine this device, which is precisely what we ordered, something that solves the matchmaking problem and allows us to drive any load with any source. It draws no current, just measuring it, sort of like a voltmeter does, and then does to the output, whatever is necessary to make the two different differential inputs the same. Now this particular configuration, what we've done is we've connected the output of the op amp to one of the inputs. And so by the third golden rule, this minus input is going to be the same as the plus input, but is connected to the output. So the output will be exactly the input. The only thing that's changed is the equivalent source resistance, infinite on this side, zero on this side. This particular configuration, where one of the outputs is simply looped back to one of the inputs on an operational amplifier, is called a follower or sometimes a buffer. And the term buffer um, comes from the idea that it buffers circuits of one resistance against those of another resistance. And it's extremely common uh, in modular electronics to find followers or buffers, op amps, with this simple feedback loop. Uh, inserted before and after every set of electronics. So we'll be doing the same um, later this week. Uh, the follower name simply indicates that the voltage out is a voltage in. It seems like a dumb component. Why couldn't I do it with a wire? The answer we now understand is because sometimes we have inputs uh, that don't are not perfect. They have a finite to Venon resistance, and we often have sources that also aren't perfectly good either. They also have... Uh, non-infinite uh, to Venon or, or, uh, or load resistances. And so although V out equals V in for the follower, it's the buffering capability of matching between two different resistance circuits that makes it so special. We're going to be doing quite a lot with op amps. They're one of the most important tools uh, in our toolbox, really. Um, I should mention that this magic doesn't come for free. Um, the component, of course, costs a little money and takes a little space. But also what's not shown here is a couple of tabs are on main circuit diagrams. Op amps also need power. Um, you don't get this kind of performance without putting something in. And so like other integrated circuits, like the 555 timer, the op amp also needs a power supply on its own in order to be able to do its tasks. Um, as a quick preview, here are the other basic configurations of op amps that we'll be using. Next one is called a comparator. Comparator, there's no feedback whatsoever. So I said by the third golden rule that the output has to do whatever is necessary to make the two inputs the same. Of course, here it can't. The output's not connected to anything back over here at the inputs. So if we give it some reference voltage, like, say, 2 volts, and then on the input, 
I uh, bring in um, some other voltage, which I haven't uh, determined, uh, I will see this either go all the way up or all the way down as it futilely tries to make the inputs the same, but without any connection back around. This abuse of an op-amp uh, is called a comparator. The out will be high if Vn is greater than Vref, or it'll be low if Vn is less than Vref. You can swap the order of these by swapping which pin is the plus and minus indicated on the circuit diagram of the op-amp. Um, so if again, two volts in the reference, if I bring in 1.9 volts, I will see this go low or go down towards zero volts. The moment, however, VN exceeds the reference voltage, say set to two volts, I will see it go high. This is a one bit example of a analog to digital converter, and we'll be building ADCs later in the course. The final uh, and most common uh, thing people think about when they think about op amps is actually their use as amplifiers. Uh, there's a particular amplifier called a non inverting amplifier. It has a gain, that is an increase in the output voltage, which is given by the ratio of resistors used. We'll be coming back and talking about how to build amplifiers quite a bit more. But for a moment, let's just look at the layout of this interesting circuit. Here's an input that we want to amplify. The feedback doesn't go straight back, but instead goes through the top half of what you should now recognize as a voltage divider. As a voltage divider, where the ground is set uh, at the bottom of R2, and the output is actually part of the feedback. What this means is that the voltage is divided between V out and ground by some ratio having to do with the ratio between R1 and R2, and that ratio determines what goes on the input. Since the output has to follow the input, this voltage will be at a different level, either greater or smaller than the input, and then act as an amplifier, in this case, a non-inverting amplifier. We'll be uh, using lots of these in our oscillator design uh, and in pretty much all of our subsequent projects.